us for me. And that is a study on dignity equity and looking at dignity equity as a new way to be thinking about uh, fairness in organizations for working class employees. And so I thought it would be helpful to start a little bit with my own personal research journey and then from there move into the actual study. So I started studying workplace dignity and more than a decade ago. And one of my first publications on the topic was an examination of blue collar workers and specifically underground iron ore miners and how they constructed a sense of dignity about their own work. And what I found in this study is that they didn't like to talk about their own dignity, but instead they did outgroup comparisons. That is, they talked about the dignity that was due to doctors and surgeons, as well as the dignity that was due to an unskilled ditch digger. And it was a really interesting discourse that was pervasive throughout the community. And it, what it allowed them to do was make claims for equal dignity for outgroups above them and outgroups below them. And by virtue of that, create a safe space where they could call for their own dignity without having to, what I'd say, fess up to those dignity injuries. From there in 2013, I collaborated with two colleagues of mine, Dong Jin Kang and Zhou Li. And we studied um, the Foxconn suicides through a workplace dignity lens. So you probably all recall that in about 2010, there was a rash of suicides at this manufacturing plant that produced chips and iPhones and pretty much anything that plugs in um, or has a button on it in your home is produced by Foxconn. And young people were committing suicide at their factories in China by jumping out of factory windows. And claims throughout this is that the company said, but we're treating people with dignity. What we did is we used Hodson's dignity lens to examine how Foxconn's total institution, uh, total institution structure exacerbated attempts to claim dignity. And we looked at conditions of overwork, incursions on professional and personal autonomy, uh, uh, forced participation in company events and mismanagement and particularly abuse um, at the hands of supervisors and how this created not only a culture of indignity, but in a total institution, one that seemed inescapable. From there, I also um, did another study using Hodson's uh, framework, actually Hodson's data, applying it with uh, Bolton's framework of dignity factors. So Sharon Bolton is somebody who you may have read her work where she talks about dignity being uh, composed of dignity in work factors. Those are the dignity that's derived, that's inherent to the work, things like meaningful work and challenge versus dignity at work, which are the conditions of employment, things like fair wages and safe and healthy working conditions. And what we did is we examined Hodson's book length ethnography data set with Bolton's lens of what contributes to dignity. And what we found, not surprising, is that dignity led to things like uh, people being more engaged in the work, and less uh, wanting to uh, be, uh, decrease turnover intentions. Um, but we also found some very interesting factors about people's resistance to indignity. And perhaps the most interesting factor of this is that it was only people who had safe and secure working conditions who are able to engage in productive resistance against dignity threats. So you can see that I've spent a lot of time working on dignity, specifically looking at working class populations. And so in 2015, I did a study where I was more interested in how do people talk about dignity? What does it mean? And is there a way we can get a full sense of what dignity is in the workplace? And what I did is I conducted 
uh, focus groups with a cross section of workers in the Midwestern US. Um, I had everybody from low, you know, some of the lowest level um, manual and unskilled laborers up through skilled professionals, um, including political speech writers and funeral home directors on, on the high end. And what we heard were four consistent themes, that dignity reflects respect in how people talk to one another and how, how they are talked to by others, that there is a recognition of their competence and contribution that they bring to their position, regardless of what, whatever position they hold, and that there are efforts to remediate injuries of inequality and remediate injuries of expendability in organizations. And we really saw these as our four key takeaways. We really saw these as our four key takeaways uh, with what dignity means. And from there, I developed a scale with Benjamin Thomas from uh, then the University of Nebraska Omaha to measure dignity. So we have a, a scale that measures these four uh, contributions. And do you see these red scribbles on your screen? I don't know what they are or how they got there. Does anybody know? Can I erase the annotations? I'm not sure how, is, did that happen during, in your presentation mode or in the Yeah, okay, Zoom? okay, erase. Okay. Somebody is is trolling the call and crashed on to do that. So there's, there's somebody on here who's okay. trying to mess with the hour. Sure, okay, thank you. Um, so the scribbles are off now. All right, so this brings me up to the most current um, research project that I have worked on in this space. And that is a project with um, Jacqueline Tilton, uh, Jennifer Kish Gephardt, and Justin Kent. And what we examined was workplace dignity threats of people at various job levels, upper, middle, and lower level jobs, and found that people, depending on what level they are at in that kind of career hierarchy, if you will, is that they experience very different kinds of threats. At the very lowest level, low level workers, people like grocery store cashiers and oil change attendants and fast food workers experience dignity threats as dehumanizing, disparaging, um, almost abuse that's coming from bosses and customers who demean them and make them feel even less than they know that they are. At the middle levels, people don't seem to, not that those kinds of threats don't exist, but their primary form of dignity threat comes when they can't make their fullest contribution and can't be recognized for their fullest competence. So these are people who feel thwarted, whether it's by somebody who's out to get them or maybe by a system as a whole, that they're not able to achieve all that they want to achieve. At the highest level, um, executives, high-powered attorneys, surgeons, these are people who say that their dignity is threatened when they, their special expertise and their special status is not recognized. So we see that dignity is very different depending on where you are in the organization. And so that leads me to the current project, the project on dignity equity. So as you have seen from my journey, I've spent a lot of time at that intersection of social class and dignity. And um, before I get too far, I do wanna do a shout out to my colleagues, Angela Just Mackey, who's at the University of Kansas and Jacqueline Tilton at Appalachian State, who've been with me on this journey. And we were really interested with Angela being somebody who has studied social class and Jacqueline being somebody who has studied dignity um, and both of them interested in issues of diversity, equity and inclusion. We were both excited by and a little bit perhaps frustrated by this 
intersection of inequality and diversity, equity, and inclusion. So there are two growing fields uh, or foci, foci of um, organizational behavior research. We're paying a lot of attention to both of those these days. And yes, we're paying more attention to issues of social class, but what we're not doing is really paying true attention to how social class is a really critical element of diversity, equity, and inclusion, particularly at a management level. And Barry in 2014, um, shared this comment that diversity management tends to focus on minorities, um, experience in organization or women up against the glass ceiling, but it tends to exclude those people who drive trucks, pack boxes on the factory floor or clean bathrooms. And I think that that is still true today. And we can think about it in terms of human resource management from an on the ground business practice standpoint. We have laws that protect people from discrimination in terms of gender, race, age, national origin, disability status, the list goes on and on and it includes so many elements of diversity but it doesn't include social class. We have ERGs set up in organizations for a number of diversity-based differences. Um, all of the ones that have legal protections and even things um, that don't have legal protections. Things like young professionals or employees who are parents. Um, so we have these kinds of um, diversity groups, but we have push, you know, a big push in management oftentimes to stop what we would call organizing of lower working classes because that sounds like building unions. And so we're not spending a lot of time talking to those things. And so our question is, what would it mean for organizations to treat social class seriously as a dimension of diversity? And so of course, we're taking this from a workplace dignity lens. This idea that we're looking at the self-recognized and other recognized worth acquired from or injured by engaging in work activity. And so it's that worth component, that competence and contribution that people can build and deploy in work. Whether or not other people recognize that, that's that other recognized component and whether people see that in themselves. And so when we look at those three kind of components as a dignity lens, we have to attend to issues of inequality. Because as a relational and comparative concept, dignity is indeed impacted by equality or inequality. So when, if I'm trying to decide whether or not my employer respects me, I'm gonna look at my pay compared to others. I'm gonna look at how I'm talked to compared by other compared to others in the organization. And even in my own previous research is people want those dignity inequalities or those inequalities of treatment to be remediated. They see that as a focus of dignity. And so it's really important that we're focusing on two types of inequalities in organization. And this is really key for this argument is that Andrew Sayer says that there's two types of inequalities that impact dignity, there's those identity in different inequalities, those unequal treatments that are structurally embedded, they have nothing to do with who someone is, and identity sensitive inequalities, which are the inequalities of interpersonal treatment that are linked to people's identities. So again, if we think about an organization and um, trying to deal seriously with inequality in an organization tied to people's identities. We might think of how people may look at gender inequality in an organization. What they would do is they would identify that um, identity difference, right? So I'm gonna look at women in organizations. I might measure important outcomes of interest. So I might measure things like 
promotion, I might measure things like pay, and I'm going to look to see if there are differences or inequalities. If there are inequalities, then I'm going to reme remediate those. But what happens with these identity in different inequalities in social work is that the answer is, or the response tends to be is, but that's just how it is for those jobs. Of course, lower paid workers are paid less. By definition, that's the case. Um, and so we see that there is, if not resistance, at least inattention to issues of difference because the, the, the justification is that these are warranted differences and they are identity indifference. So I am not making any any specific targeting of individuals who come in. It's just that the person that holds this job on the shop floor, that is what the pay is for that job. These are what the working conditions are. So what my colleagues and I did is we have begun engaging in a qualitative meta-study. This is kind of like a quantitative meta-analysis, but done with qualitative research. The reason why is that most of the existing research on workplace dignity is done from a qualitative standpoint. And this is the types of research that renders thick, rich descriptions about the unique ways that people's dignity is stripped in different organizations. So my colleagues and I examined, uh, we identified 21 qualitative studies of workplace dignity that were US-based, that focused on working class occupations, and they represented a variety of qualitative methods. So the people uh, represented in these studies are meat packers, poultry plant workers, job training pro, um, trainees, food service, housekeeping, manual laborers, um, that kind of job. And centered on US-based only um, to, to draw a very practical boundary to not conflate with cultural differences. Some of my favorite studies in the world and some of the most poignant are coming out of non-US based contexts. Um, I'm thinking of some of the work that is done um, by a friend and colleague of mine in India, um, which are incredible, but we wanted to focus on the US to, to keep that a little bit cleaner. Um, and so one of the things that we have identified is that working class employees indeed experience dignity harms by, identi by identity indifferent equalities. So the identity indifferent structural differences of financial reward, economic precarity, health and, healthy and safe working conditions and autonomy do inflict dignity harms. And so there are differences in financial reward, thinking about setting pay scales, um, determining benefits, things that are set in identity different ways, reduce or create dignity harms because it prevents people from getting full realization of an indicator of their achievement, an enabler of positive identities, um, and low wages um, that can, in some cases, still keep people on welfare rolls despite doing work, um, despite putting in full-time work. Um, some examples um, are Cleveland in 2005 examines women who were welfare recipients who were forced into um, paid work, um, but as a government program, the employers were only required to pay them a sub-minimum wage, uh, sub-minimum wage, wage. And that uh, enabled all kinds of questioning of their value and, and a devaluing of the work that they were doing. Well, Coxon and Moore um, likewise study a job training program where trainers are actively getting people to reduce their expectations of what they are able to accomplish um, financially and professionally. And these rewards, this lack of financial reward can be a threat to working class dignity. 
we see that identity in different practices of um, setting up safety nets or, or other kinds of security measures can create uh, feelings of expendability that exacerbate instead of remediate those dignity threats. And so what employers see is a lack of commitment between the employer and employee. It can increase their feelings of expendability. Actually, yeah, it, it, uh, a lack of economic precarity increases feelings of expendability. It can make them feel that they're highly instrumental. Stuce et al. Um, does a great study of a meat packing plant where employees are regularly injured on the job. And then as um, employees describe is that they are thrown away like broken utensils or broken tools after they are no longer able to do the work. Other kinds of conditions that create precarity are lack of sick paid time off for sick days, um, lesser um, rewards or security nets for, for uh, employees, and also a propensity amongst the lowest ranks for supervisors to use threats of firing as a means of control. We also see that working conditions can be a threat to dignity, particularly unsafe and dirty work. And so I want to draw your attention here um, to the work by Villamil and Denbo, uh, who are studying uh, essential workers during the COVID pandemic. And so whereas safe and healthy working conditions confers recognition of the value of the person beyond their immediate work role, when things are unsafe and life is put at risk without proper precautions, people feel that their worth as a human being is not acknowledged. And in Villamil and Denbo's work, they describe um, essential workers saying that during the pandemic, they felt like little lambs that were being put out for slaughter. Other people in work that I have done have said that um, companies that have put their health and their safety at risk from denying them the time um, to take proper safety precautions, make them feel as though they don't care if they get home to their families at night. Finally, autonomy is another way that, that identity in different uh, differences come into play because autonomy conveys trust in people's competence and judgment, it regards them as people who can be treated seriously, it fosters a sense that they are in control of their own lives and, and have the ability to make informed decisions about how they do their work, and yet we see that working class employees are often denied professional autonomy. Crowley, for example, did an ethnographic uh, re-immersion study of the Workplace Ethnography Project and found that professional workers tended be, to be controlled by um, professional development and autonomy, but working class workers, service and production workers, were controlled mechanistically and through threats of termination, and that these forms of control reduced their autonomy and thereby created dignity threats. And so in all of these ways, we see things that companies do indifferent to the identities that people bring to the organization, but we find that these create threats to their dignity. But what we also need to realize is that these material inequalities serve at least partially as a basis for class-based identity construction. That is by virtue of hiring people into working class jobs, paying them working class wages, giving them working class benefits, and treating them with the kinds of autonomy or reduced autonomy is that those contribute to creating a class-based identity construction such that food service workers, manual laborers, and et cetera, um, become that class. Um, 
And so once that happens, then we can see that then that initiates identity sensitive inequalities. So now this is the adding the insult to injury component of this is we now see that once people have that working class identity, it gives way to unequal treatment at work and unequal treatment out of work. And this can be gratuitous attentions to inequalities, exclusion, invisibility, more prone to general disrespect and less able to defend themselves against disrespect. And so uh, the Rabelo article in 2019 examined um, university cleaners, janitors, and custodians, and looked at how people treated them as invisible and did not see them, and how they saw that as deep threats to their dignity. In the article I did with my colleague Jacqueline Tilton, um, she and I showed how employees at the lowest ranks, baristas, um, oil change attendants, fast food workers, they were people who received on a regular basis what we call sort of the death by a thousand paper cuts, indignities on a daily basis that came from abuses from customers and abuses from supervisors. And knowing that there weren't other options that they had to withstand that. We also see that there's unequal treatment outside of work because once these class-based identities come in place, and without say the, the financial rewards that give people status outside of work or at least um, cover, we see that there's things like lower social status, stigma and class-based rule, uh, ridicule and attempt that can inflict dignity injuries beyond the workplace. Um, even my colleague, Angela Just Mackey, who studies unemployment organizations she finds that people who are coming from being unemployed in white collar positions are treated as clients by um, reemployment organizations where they are talked to about their resumes and skills development and finding the right positions. But when blue collar workers are unemployed, they are treated in a demeaning way where they are kind of forced into, you know, um, implicit bias about maybe not trying that hard to look for work, you know, that they, they need to work on, you know, body cleanliness, that they need to work on improving their grammar. So they're, they're treated in disparaging ways as they are seeking assistance for reemployment. And so what does this mean? It means that we need a different way of measuring inequality on the job. Because again, when we see that management's identity indifferent inequalities create these threats, but, but they have the justification that those are not a problem because they are identity indifferent. And then we see that those identity or identity indifferent differences create threats that translate to an identity that is then threatened, the, the justification there is perhaps it's out of our control. Like that, that is beyond the control of the organization of how people are treated outside of work, but they're inextricably linked. And so we need a different way of measuring inequality. And so what my coworkers and I, uh, promote as a possibility is that dignity equity may be the missing link. And this is not, um, it's moving the focus from equity off of these different individual factors. We're not talking about a difference of pay and we are not talking about you know, differences in treatment. You know, maybe that is beyond the, the scope in some ways of managers, but what if we told them that, what if they held up instead an idea that what the outcome should be is that all employees should have a right to equitable perceptions of their own dignity being upheld. This would meet people where they're at. 
it would keep the focus on something more holistic and meaningful, and it would provide a way for management to measure whether there are substantive differences between working class populations and non-working class populations in organizations. Because we know the comparison of pay doesn't work. If you're paying lower ranked employees low wage, you can't compare that to itself. It becomes tautological. Dignity equity creates this missing link. And what that might look like is that management gets attuned to the most common injuries and be willing to make adjustments. So they start by surveying their employees about their experiences of dignity and comparing that to see how um, those experiences of dignity could be um, different for different groups, whether it is um, gender, race, but particularly for us, is it different between working class and non-working class populations? And then what they would be able to do by drilling down a little bit further is to identify what are the factors that are making that difference and making adjustments until dignity equity is achieved. And so that is kind of our big idea here. I do wanna leave time for Q&A, but the big takeaways here is that identity indifferent and identity sensitive inequalities are indeed type, tightly coupled. And they have far reaching implications for how working class populations experience dignity at work. And so working class employees do indeed have significant challenges in achieving a full sense of dignity at work. And by taking social class more seriously, and perhaps by using a tool of dignity equity to get there, we think that DEI efforts can be better targeted for working class employees. And so with that, I'd be glad to open up for questions, comment, and and hopefully some great discussion. Thank you so much, Kristen, for this rich overview of your research. So if you want, um, we can stop screen sharing to sure. see more people on the screen. Sure thing. I will stop sharing. Yes, I have, I've never, witnessed this annotations tool in action before. I mm. know, couldn't figure out how to turn it off. If anybody <laughs> knows it, please write to me. And otherwise I'm gonna Google it after this meeting oh, and sure. uh, we'll, we'll talk, we'll, we'll kind of do it in the next meeting. All right, so sorry about this, like drawings that were happening. Mm -hmm. All right, so- let's So do you to... want me to start with the questions in the comments? Um, we could do that. If anyone also would like to ask in person by raising your hand, that could be also a good start. Yeah. Michael is raising your, your hand. Okay, Michael, go ahead. Get us started. Yeah, no, thank you. I'm 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 thinking I'm gonna get us started if there are others that wanna go ahead. I think this would be helpful and good. Um and um thank you. This is uh, very rich and and interesting. And I think it may counter contradict some of the other dignity research out there, sort of saying like this distinction between respect and dignity and between that which is accorded. Uh, from outside to that which is afforded from the inside, right? Mm -hmm. So one of my questions was just purely understanding to get clarity on the economic precarity that you were mentioning there. It seemed counterintuitive to what my understanding was that precarity is actually um, increasing the sense of dignity violations. But you're saying, at least if the, I understood the slide correctly, that yeah. when people are in the precarious situation, they yeah. actually... Dignity threats are diminished. Yes. And what I had done is I had flipped, when I read that, I got tripped up because I had flipped my connotation 
on the, some of them were like, what does economic security? I had started, that was a typo. Um, I di didn't catch on the slide. So what I was saying about the other ones is that financial reward is an external gauge of worthiness. It's an internal indicator, right? And so then financial security, right, creates all those things. And so I was doing the positives wow. on one and the negatives on the other, and I didn't flip my wording in. Oh, okay, so so precarity and, does indeed absolutely. exacerbate the yes. dignity. Yeah, yeah, yes. no, okay, I got it. Just yeah. wanted to clarify that. Okay, yeah. thanks. I, I had I had talked about like lower, yeah, it, it was in, it was flipping back between, should I talk about it, is increased, precarity or decreased security. And in my multiple iterations of the slides, one of them got flipped and the other one did it. My apologies. Okay, got it, got it. No worries, no worries. But I think, okay. <laughs> that so makes then, a lot more then, sense, right? <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, so then precarity actually does, yes, it's not like, absolutely. oh, okay, because now I'm totally worried about finance. I don't care about my inner value anymore. It's not, no, no, no. Right. It's like no. It's exacerbated as a, yes, as a sense. Exacerbated. Okay, got it, got it. Perfect. Um, I think the other one was just sort of more general uh, in terms of the way of looking at dignity through, I think, the diversity, equity and inclusion lens. I think Donna Hicks and I were oftentimes having a conversation that this DEI conversation, as it is typically had, is missing is missing the boat in a way that I think you're sort of also showcasing that there are lots of groups that are excluded mm -hmm. if they're not considered marginal or we don't have a categorization or an identity piece to it. And I believe there's something bigger there that this whole identity politics or whole identity focus is missing the potential of dignity as something universal. Right. And that the universality of it may come through in some of the work that you're doing, but then it also may challenge some of the context of equity, right? If dignity is universal mm -hmm. and it is not accorded from the outside, mm -hmm. how can there be equity? There can be equity potentially through the inner awareness, almost Marxist types of consciousness awareness of, of that. Um, yeah. What are you seeing there? Because um, I think you're pointing to both, right? Yeah. But uh, it's like, yeah. And, and I think that that's where the definition of dignity is really important, because I do know that there are competing definitions out there. And one of the definitions is dignity is just something you have. It's an inalienable. It's a thing that every single person has, period. Yeah, and that's the end of the sentence. But what my research has shown is that, and I try to differentiate human dignity from workplace dignity, is that when you talk to people, when, when you go off of this empirical standpoint, is that dignity is something that is both inherent and earned. And so in a workplace, you know, the, the interesting thing about the workplace and why I think it, it needs a different definition is goes back to this idea that if dignity is something that that is a Kantian definition of dignity is something that is above all price. When you enter a workplace, you are exchanging labor for a price, right? And so it, it's incommensurable kind of with that. Um, definition. And when I have talked to people about what dignity and work means to them, very consistently, they'll say, I am a human and I've got my human worth, but I also have my instrumental worth. And so my, my, my work is also valued. My contributions are all, also valued. Um, and so it's a value, it's a, a, a recognition of the humanity, but also a recognition of the instrumental value um, as an extension of that human, um, both of those getting valued in the workplace. And so that's the definition that I operate from. Um, and, and I think that that becomes then the key to how we can talk about dignity equity here. Thank you for pushing me on that. Uh, Marty? Mm -hmm. Thanks, uh, Kristen, for uh, this. I know it's a big survey of a lot of issues, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, as a, as a uh, semi-retired industrial psychologist, 
but now working as a humanist chaplain up here in Canada, <clears throat> I'm curious uh, about the interaction and covariates that you found in your populations that were immigrants. We have up here in Canada, uh, people come on work visas and it only allows them to work in a certain company. Mm -hmm. One of our largest, uh, per perhaps like uh, Canada Tire or something like that. Mm -hmm. And if they in any way run into problems there and uh, the immigration uh, is challenged in any way, they ha are forced to go back home. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they have been mistreated in these environments because there is no choice mm -hmm. about staying and changing jobs. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have also had real problems with not so much our professional immigrants that come like our Filipino doctors and mm -hmm. from India and things, but when we get into the working class and we have issues with language and things like this, I talked to our Punjab taxi drivers. I did some consulting with them. And because they don't speak great English, they were treated very rudely by their clients. So I'm wondering in your research, did you do any covariance around immigration and language being able to speak English? Well, I... I would say that in this qualitative study, we're not using any covariance. But what I can tell you in more holistically in response to your comment is that several of the studies that we are looking at in this qualitative metasynthesis, uh, it does involve immigrant laborers. And that's exactly the problem that they are facing is that they don't feel that there's other options. Um, and so they are dealing with um, abuse by supervisors. They are dealing with unsafe working conditions. Um, they are dealing with a whole bunch of disrespect and they feel like it is a no way out situation. Um, and so uh, there are um, stories about um, people getting like very badly injured on the job in meatpacking plants and having to go back to work um, not being able to unionize um, for fear of losing their jobs. I mean, the list goes on and on. And it absolutely that um, not having a choice or not perceiving that there's a choice, and in some cases, not re really not having a choice, absolutely um, exacerbates the situation because it puts them in a situation where they have to endure um, those indignities. Mm -hmm. Did you find a higher percent were immigrants based on the demographics? Um, again, with the studies that we are looking at, normally qualitative studies are going into like one context. And so um, the studies of immigrant workers, and there's about five or six in this data set of, uh, and I'll be glad to send you that list of those studies, um, they are looking explicitly at immigrant laborers. Some of the other ones are explicitly looking at another group that aren't immigrants. And so um, I don't recall if there's any that were really kind of a mix in comparing the two uh, to give you any kind of breakdown like that. But I, I'd be glad to share the, the list of studies. I've listed them. That's great. I've got it. I got your copies. So okay. you don't need to send me anything. OK. All right. <laughs> Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. We have a few more hands and uh, not enough time, so uh, let's try to go through all of them in fast mode. Naveen, and then William, and then Anke we have, and maybe we can also go through a few questions from the chat if we have time. Sure. I think you're Naveen, on you're, Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I think I was on mute. Uh, is my audio okay? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, a great topic. Uh, I being a you know, research uh, researcher on the workplace uh, spirituality, I think that's the umbrella term. <laughs> um, so uh, you know, in terms of empirical analysis, uh, the DEI uh, is that a direct correlation with the workplace dignity? Do you find if you take care of DEI, uh, it it automatically take care of the dignity, workplace dignity, Christine? Mm -hmm. 
I would say not automatically. I would say that there is certainly a correlation, but it, it I would not say that it has um, a, it's not an all encompassing correlation, okay. right? So you can make improvements in some way and still have dignity threats in other ways. Okay. Still yes. it can impact on the dignity, okay? And uh, I hope, you know, certainly there is a negative correlation for the productivity loss and uh, financial impact. Uh, so mm -hmm. do you have any empirical analysis on this? I have not correlation? I have not done that yet. Or I maybe I'm not doing that at all. Um, but that's something that somebody could certainly do, for sure. Yeah, you know when it comes to an organization, and uh, if you have to convince the the top management, obviously it's all the ROI. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, sure. what's what's my loss? What's yes. what's the financial impact? So yeah, sure. I think it's it's more from a top down approach. Mm -hmm. Okay, and other factor what I see, you know, in terms of human, uh, it's more of a psychological and behavioral impact. Mm -hmm. um, so, is there any such empirical analysis done on on these two factors? On, on really psychological and behavioral impact. Yeah. Uh, yes, there's a number of studies. Um, you know, I have done a, a mixed method study that shows that um, dignity increases engagement decreases counterproductive work behavior. Um, other studies have shown an increase in uh, knowledge sharing. I have another study underway, um, under review that shows that dignity increases innovative work behaviors. Uh, so there's a, a, research is really research starting is to look at those connections. Yeah, because we have seen, you know, very negative consequences, uh, as you mentioned about the examples from Foxconn, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. suicidal uh, from an employee. That's that's the the two negative aspect. Uh, sure. Okay, and and the last but not the least, uh, why maybe, we are in the AI. Maybe, uh, maybe you know, when you hold for a second, just we come back to you if we have time, because there are a few more faults. Ah, we have sure, very sure. Time thank you very okay, much. Thank you. Yeah. William? Yeah, hey, absolutely. Kristen. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Kristen, good to see you again. Great talk. Um, can you hear me okay? Uh, not so good. Oh, okay. Let me try to turn up my volume then. Better? A little better. Okay. I, I can hear you. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I was just I was just kind of curious about this kind of idea of um like blue collar um workers and kind of how you know how do they in in most of the research that you've done or seen do, do the individuals themselves kind of identify themselves as blue collar or like how does that kind of um how do we kind of distinguish uh, blue collar and white collar workers a little bit better in research um mm -hmm. is something i was just wondering about well, I'd say in my studies of blue collar workers, they absolutely identified themselves as blue collar. Um, and I think that there is uh, pretty good clarity around what blue collar work is. There is less clarity around what white collar work is um, because white collar work is dramatically changing. Um, and, and so I think that there are um, intersections, especially based on social class and white collar work that need further ex exploration. Mm. Maybe I will loop you into that conversation offline. <laughs> sure, yes, well, thank you. Yes, I'll let uh, uh, the next uh, person go. Yes. Thanks. Thank you. Anke? Yeah, hi, thanks for having me. and. Yeah, great, um, great insights. And I've been following your work for a long time, Kristen. And, um, and my research in dignity is mainly about tourism and hospitality work, mm -hmm. so, which is some, somewhat related, but also different. So <clears throat> a couple of questions you somewhat answered that when you answered Naveen's question um, in terms of, I get asked all the time by industry, give me evidence that that increases my business profits. 
Mm -hmm. So it's a bit like the environmental debate, you know, they only act when when it makes business sense. Mm -hmm. So it would be great if you could share something about that um, to provide that evidence base. Um, and then I liked it that you had a positive twist saying, OK, this is how we can achieve mm -hmm. dignity by um, engaging, working with organizations. How? Because you, you mentioned anti-union sentiment, which is mm -hmm. uh, quite strong in some countries. Mm -hmm. So do you have any research or anywhere you can point me to say this mechanism mm -hmm. works to engage with industry? Sure. Well, I can send that to the list afterwards, um, a, a list of some studies that I was talking to Naveen about some of these. Um, that workplace dignity, now that we have a tool for measuring it, is people are starting to show that it is tied to um, decreasing negative behaviors and increasing positive behaviors. Like I said, um, employee engagement increases, intent to turnover decreases. So if they're looking to decrease turnover, that's a great way um, to achieve a benefit. Um, we see a decrease in counterproductive work behaviors, right? So less theft, less retaliation. So that's a really good thing. Um, increased in knowledge sharing, increased creativity and innovation. Um, so, and I would say, even though companies may not care as much about this, but when you have increased health and well-being, you also have decreases in healthcare costs. And so that's a benefit as well. And I'll be- yeah, okay. So share. I think I think these are great. Um, this is great munition for the business case. And yeah. one comment in terms of the um, previous question, white collars dignity. So I've, I'm just back from a large labor union Congress. Okay. And what was interesting that amongst the 2000 affiliates there, um, there were several white collar workers mm -hmm. who said, you know, we feel not actually enough represented because we're perceived as management, right. not we work in accounting, we might work in um, at reception or whatever it is. So this distinction between like who, who are the white collar workers, I think we have the exact same issues. Mm -hmm. So I think that is a that is a fantastic topic. So I encourage everyone to to look into that that won't be me yes. but others maybe um definitely a good topic mm -hmm. thank you for that thank you okay and we have wolfridge raising hand a couple of really good questions in the chat too if we have time um hi, hi, hi. professor lucas uh, thank you very much and say hello to kentucky for me i graduated from berea oh, um cool. and so i've been interested in social equity for some time mm -hmm. I, two points. Um, the, the intersectionality between uh, uh, working class and also other demographics like race, gender, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if there's um, uh, anything in your research that shows that different people from different uh, uh, identity groups, a term I like to use, mm -hmm. Uh, at the same level of the organization, experience different perceptions of diversity. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing, being an old academic in many ways, um, I'm interested in applying this to higher education mm -hmm. and how we treat our adjuncts. Mm -hmm. But thanks for the great presentation. Thank you. Well, what I can say about different kinds of identity groups is that absolutely we know that people's identity changes how they perceive um, their, their any given situation. Um, I've done research with one of my um, graduate students where we looked at LGBT employees. And so they definitely experience dignity threats in a different way that could be imperceptible to people who are not LGBT. Um, what I can also say is that there has not at least US-based research not been a lot of attention to issues of race and ethnicity in the samples that are published. We have good studies with um, immigrant groups 
And then we have good studies with occupational groups, but they tend to not have a lot of racial diversity in them. And so I think more work is definitely needed looking at intersections of race, um, ethnicity, and gender. And the, the question is, how do you apply this to higher ed? Oh my gosh, higher ed needs this. And I think <laughs> one of the, so I spent a five-year stint, you probably saw that there was a gap in my research record. I spent a five-year stint in administration. And one of the issues that we definitely have are divisions between our tenured and our non-tenure eligible employees. And I would think that there's an even a bigger gap between them and then our adjunct laborers, right? And so we have sort of this three class system in higher ed. And it's a really complicated system because if you think about those as upper middle, lower level employees, you have adjuncts at the bottom with the least pay, the most precarity, the least respect, Right, so all of these dignity, dignity threats going on. And some of my research would say, you know, that they need to be brought up and not taken down. But then at the high end, when you look at my research about high status employees, if you're looking at tenured professors or endowed chairs, some of those people, some of my research would say that some of them, in order for them to have dignity, they would say that they need to have their special status recognized. How can you recognize somebody's special status if you're trying to make everybody acknowledge? And, and we actually had those fights in my university between what I'll, I'll dare say were kind of warring factions of, we need to have more status than those people. And, and people below were saying, we need to have the, the status that we're entitled to. And so if status, if dignity for some people is being above others and dignity for some people is being equal to others, it, it becomes an unsolvable problem. But it's one that I'm, I'm is worthy of working on a solution nonetheless, right? Thank you, Kristen. And thank you for the last question, Woodridge. Mr. Bullridge, uh, we are by the hour. We're thankful for your time and all your wisdom today on this important topic, Kristen, and to everybody with your questions and engagement. I know there's more in the chat and we will save them and share with you, Kristen, and we will hope to um, post the recording uh, on the website as well. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll be back. And for November, we have another one of these EMA research seminars with Ashley Villains. It's gonna be we're gonna be talking about workplace well-being. Please join us in November. Thank you so much for being a part of this seminar series and one big round of applause for Kristen. <laughs> Have a wonderful rest of the day, everybody. And, and let me just say, if anybody wants to continue further, you can drop me an email and uh, I'd be happy to hop on a call or, or chat via email. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. This was great. I'm trying to save the chat. You got too much. All right. I'll close the room. I hope you are well. It was very nice seeing you. Nice seeing you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.